Je vais d'abord le mettre là. Je vais essayer de... Ça marche Oui. Yes. It's working. Bonsoir, That's good. Well, good evening uh, to, uh, uh, to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for being here for this uh, debate uh, that's entitled uh, Is Democracy Soluble in the Internet? So what are the uh, uh, social media doing? Uh, how do we call them? And uh, the uh, use of data, does it have uh, an impact on the political debate? Uh, so how, how can we actually uh, uh, get out of all of this? How can we avoid it? And uh, so we're going to st start by... Uh, um, I'll start by introducing uh, Thomas Huchon, who is the director of the film. So he is the director of this film, The Unfair Game, and uh, certainly everything but reassuring. Tosi. Well, good evening, everyone. Already, I'd like to uh, uh, thank you for being so many of you, and I'd like to thank the festival for having uh, decided to uh, screen this film. And uh, so I I'm very moved. And uh, this is the, the, the first uh, uh, public screening of this documentary that was uh, released in June 2017 on a, uh, a new media, which is uh, involved in a documentary documentaries. And uh, so at the very beginning, when we start uh, an investigation, we don't quite know uh, what is going to lead us or where it's going to lead us. It just so happened that in this uh, investigation, I didn't uh, imagine I'd discover uh, the existence of such uh, manipulation techniques, manipulation of the uh, public opinion. I had no, uh, I wasn't aware of this. And uh, so if, uh, if I had only one wish to make is that this film and all the people who participated in the making of this film, so he, I'm alone here in front of you today, but I mean, there are many, many people, you know, behind the scenes in the making uh, of a film, not just the technicians, but all those who accept uh, uh, giving some time to explain uh, the issues uh, and they give their time. And if I were to actually uh, uh, make a wish uh, before uh, we uh, embark upon uh, the uh, uh, debate, that I'm sure is going to be uh, fascinating. So here's my wish. So uh, we uh, tend to forget too often that when you are in the uh, world of internet, that is a virtual uh, world, well, this universe can become real. And we also tend to forget that uh, when one uh, uses uh, uh, free services, the product is us, you, me, us. So we're well aware of the fact that you know marketing techniques are used uh, uh, left, right, and center. And I don't think we'd. Uh, 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 understood that we could use it to, uh, for political uh, uh, reasons and uh, uh, so okay I'm not saying this the message is systematically negative of course you need to raise awareness but the fact that things need to be changed so that these techniques will no longer be used in the future to manipulate people but I don't want this film uh, to be a, a, a negative film or pessimistic film but democracy needs to be defended day in day out morning to evening evening to morning so something <laughs> You know, uh, it's not here forever. We need to defend democracy. And uh, uh, in the face of all the uh, disruptions, and uh, and uh, uh, this was explained very well in the film by Carol uh, Cadwallard, and, and after uh, the, the music and cinema and the media, the new industry, as she called it, that's been uh, disrupted by uh, uh, technology is uh, politics. Politics is something that we all share. And uh, I think we have to preserve it. We need to protect it. And I hope that this film uh, will have actually lifted the, 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 the veil and you will have seen behind the veil and if you have any questions at the end I hope I'll be able to answer those questions and I think the time has come for, for the debate. Thank you very much uh, Thomas. Uh, so we'll have uh, the, the, the time to discuss this with uh, 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 Sylvain Gisler who is the co-founder of uh, Operation Libero who will join us at the end. So I'll ask our three panelists to, to join us on stage. Donc par ordre d'apparition. So, uh, Paul Olivier de Hay, uh, so Paul Olivier de Hay, mathematician, so co-founder of uh, personaldata.io, which is a service aiming at helping internet users to uh, recoup control over their data. So uh, a lot of work. So uh, Evelyn. Uh, uh, Evgeny Morozovs is a, a writer and essay writer, author of The Net Delusion, and uh, to my knowledge, uh, did not uh, have 
Non, the French n'est pas traduit, mais qui, uh, qui abordait uh, la, la question des. It wasn't translated into French, but uh, it was about the use of uh, uh, technologies and authoritarian regimes, which is a counterpoint to the uh, techno-optimistic uh, uh, approach and another and to solve everything. Click here, and that was translated into French. And then we have Ivan Kastev, he's a politologist, and he's a researcher at the uh, Human Centers of Vienna and the director of uh, the Center for Liberal Strategies of Sofia. So I'm going to start by uh, asking you, uh, uh, again, your, your, your reaction to this documentary, and uh, how do you react to the uh, uh, Mercer ecosystem that relies on, on, on media? We saw the role of uh, uh, Breibart News, but also uh, that uh, relies on uh, Cambridge Analytica, uh, that uh, is a specialist in uh, uh, electoral micro-targeting. So, uh, Yvon Krastev, we'll start with you. Normally, people start with me because I'm the least knowledgeable about technology. Uh, but uh, but let's tell a story. It's, it's a very interesting film, and of course, there is a lot of stories to talk about technology. Uh, but let's start, let's tell you a story about fake news, which is slightly older. In 1924, one week before the parliamentary elections in Great Britain, one of the most important conservative tabloids published a letter which was basically allegedly the letter of the leader of the Communist International, Zinoviev. And this was basically a message to the communists within the Labour Party. A week later, you have the elections, and basically, the Labour Party lost. The Labour Party was sure that because of this fake and uh, news, they lost the elections. Years later, a very famous British historian, A.P. Taylor, showed that it was not because of the Zinoviev letter that they lost these elections, but it was because of the Zinoviev letter that they lost the next elections. Because they never understood why they really lost. And here's my story, and this is the question that I want to ask. Mercer was very much a story about technology and how technology worked. There was a micro-targeting on the other side, too. And from this point of view, if you go back to the 2012, you're going to read a book which was called Victory Lab, which was very positive, and it was about something very similar. And it was very much how micro-targeting and going with the small constituencies and basically going exactly in a very key states that matters decided Obama's elections. So from this point of view, what I do believe is very important is not to go in a simple conspiracy theory that this was the guy who did it. Obviously, something is happening in politics in general. Obviously, technology is changing this for everybody. And from this point of view, if we basically believe that it was the algorithm that solved the elections, we can end up in the position of basically the Labour Party in Britain. Uh, this is a, a real question. What is the exact impact of uh, these uh, technologies uh, over time and the result of an election? Difficult to measure the impact. Uh, so, uh, uh, Evgeny Morozov, what's your opinion about all of this? So, yes. So, uh, uh, what's your feeling? I mean, uh, uh, did it play a role? Uh, if yes, which one? Were there uh, uh, deeper social causes? Because, uh, uh, so again, Trump didn't just arise out of nothing. Um, so, uh, I think there are three big phenomena in this film that we have seen, that very often in public analysis are lumped together under the label of fake news uh, and many similar terms. One is clearly micro-targeting, based on a lot of data that is obtained legally or illegally and on which much of our economy now works. I think everybody does it. Businesses do it, Pentagon does it, State Department does it, uh, political parties do it, you must be mad not to be doing it if you're participating in a political campaign now. Um, to what extent it's legal and illegal under American and European law, we can debate, but I think there is no point pointing finger at Trump in saying that you've done it, nobody else does it, everybody does it. Then there is a second layer, and that second layer has to do with a lot of journalistic outlets that, uh, while reporting on politicians, who cut corners in making their political statements, cut corners as well. 
So Breitbart News, to some extent, would fall into that category. So the two examples that opened the film, one, I think most of them were from Breitbart, one of them reported on Trump saying that 800,000 uh, illegal immigrants voted in the election and it changed the outcome. And the other one said that research claims that uh, Hillary Clinton is engaged in criminal behavior, if I'm not um, mistaken. I mean, those are not fake news by my definition of fake news, because they are actually truthfully reporting on what was said by Trump on the one hand, and by some research on the other. Now, of course, we can say that any journalist with ethics working for an ethical investigative journalistic outlet would also add that what Trump has said, which he did, was not actually accurate, and that that did not happen. And that what research claims about Hillary Clinton is actually incorrect, as most other studies show. Now, Bright being mostly an opinion site, doesn't go through the trouble of pointing that out, so they just present it as reality. But they do say Trump said it, studies show. It's not Bright's, Bright's own news, right? So that's the second category. So this is basically journalism twisting some ethical norms and cutting some corners, in part because politicians cut corners as well. And I think many outlets do it. Trump is not solely responsible for it. There are outlets on left and right, pro-immigration, against immigration, pro-abortion, against abortion, who do that. I would not ascribe it just to the right wing people. And then there is the third category, which is the outright manufacturing of fake news, uh, which are stories that are intentionally manufactured to provide erroneous information uh, in order to gain traffic and monetize it through advertising. And political parties and political movements have discovered that this is happening, and they have taken advantage of that infrastructure to some extent. Uh, a lot of them on the right tap into it. I would argue that if you look hard enough, you would probably find some outlets on the left doing it, not to the same extent. Having said that, I think we do ourselves a very big disservice if we lump all those three phenomena together and we try to come up with a narrative that essentially does not see differences between them. Because if you analyze them separately, analytically, you will see that for some of them, as I've said, a lot of actors are involved in them. It's not specific to Breitbart, not specific to Mercer, not specific to Trump. In some of them, these guys have pioneered certain things, but across the board, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very reluctant to acknowledge that something unique is happening and exceptional is happening because most of those techniques have been used for decades. Yes, it's true that now they have been honed with a lot of personal data that has been collected, but I am very reluctant to point the fin finger to the Mercers and say that they are de facto responsible for Trump's victory because ultimately I just don't see that as a as an innovation on the one hand, and B, as an innovation that we should be weighing above all the other factors that have contributed to Trump's victory. Now, do I hate big tech? Do I think they pose a big problem? Do I think there are a lot of problems related to data? Yes. I'm just not convinced by a narrative that refuses to draw those analytical distinctions to the extent where I think they should be drawn. So, uh, Paul Olivier de Haye, you know, what is so special in the work done by uh, uh, Cambridge Analytica? It's true that uh, Mr. Uh, Krostev was saying, you know, uh, electoral uh, micro-targeting was also used by Obama, and we saw it coming in France. I remember I'd uh, worked on the uh, uh, appearance of uh, uh, the platform Nation Builder that all the, uh, uh, everyone was actually uh, using, uh, you know, France Fillon, uh, Mr. Mélenchon, and uh, which aimed exactly as that, you know, to fine tune uh, the, uh, the, the the voters and to uh, uh, cut it down to be more efficient and to know more about people. So, you know, what's so specific about Cambridge Analytica, or you know, and why is it such a problem? So, there are several companies uh, that uh, do this similar type of work, and if you want to compare uh, with what was doing in 2008, 2012 with uh, Obama, it is true. You know, the scale at which uh, it's being done today is, you know much uh, uh, wider, 
Apparently, uh, Cambridge Analytica had 58,000 uh, uh, profiles uh, on Facebook. So this is a totally different scale in terms of uh, data and also the accurateness of the data. And there's something else also uh, uh, that has to do with transparency. And you know, the, the, the better the tools, you don't need a huge uh, uh, electoral campaigns uh, to do the targeting. And uh, again, you know, very few people in uh, Trump's uh, electoral uh, campaign team. You know, I think there were C people at uh, Cambridge Analytica in the offices. Uh, of uh, Trump's uh, campaign team offices, so this uh, doesn't, uh, you know, go for much uh, transparency of the uh, democratic process. Uh, so, uh, so uh, it's another way of looking at the American electoral campaign. So you can look at it, uh, you know, as a, a failure on the part of uh, the, the Clinton team that were doing exactly the same thing. This is true. But uh, so, uh, what was the difference? So there's one uh, 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 something that's different and that hasn't been highlighted much at all, and that is you know, the interaction between the uh, uh, tar targeting, advertising targeting, and the uh, platform amplification system. So this is what the role played by Facebook. So Facebook uh, uh, plays this role to amplify the targeting to make it more accurate, more precise, and uh, and finally to uh, actually. Uh, uh, focus on some candidates rather than others just through the pricing mechanism, advertising mechanism to encourage those candidates that generate a certain type of commitment around the content that they're going to push uh, in an electoral campaign, uh, beh uh, behaviors that are more primitive, more instinctive around the sharing of content that uh, doesn't uh, encourage, uh, uh, you know, a democratic debate, but more uh, acting on impulse. And uh, so the, the platforms are um, looking at uh, what's in their uh, commercial interest. So this uh, feedback mechanism is extremely important between the targeting and the interests of the uh, platforms. And this is something very new. Uh, the, the scale, and I, I, I call it a stress test on the platforms that takes place every four years. And this was at a, a scale that's very different from what it was done in the past. Uh, so I think I saw uh, recently on Slate an ar article where uh, Facebook was used as it uh, should have been used. And uh, uh, so uh, Mr. Morozov, I mean, this is this a, a more clearer demonstration? Is this proof that these uh, these big platforms, uh, silos, that are built on uh, the exploitation of uh, personal data, uh, so is this the proof that they have technological uh, mechanisms that could be used uh, uh, to any end, uh, including t for political influence and, as you were saying, uh, as uh, you know, for commercial uh, objectives? Again, we should not minimize potential harm and damage of the ecosystem that has emerged heavily underpinned by this big media, new media giants like Facebook and Google. Not necessarily in the case of this election, where I personally don't think they have played such a big role as a lot of media make it out to be. But in general, yes, there are a lot of very negative effects with regards to discussions about immigration, religion, you know, tolerance, and so forth. I mean, it's clear that right now we are operating in a very different media environment where it's much easier for certain xenophobic populist messages to travel. And the reason why it's so easy for those messages to travel is because the ecosystem favors the speed with which that information travels, and it's done very cheaply, and there are incentives built into it because the companies that control the platforms are interested in those messages propagating because this is how they monetize activity on their networks. So yes, down the kind of down the road, we are looking at a lot of fringe forces hijacking debates with regards to climate change, with regards to many other important issues. I do not want to minimize the risks of this ecosystem. I just think that we have to be a little bit um, more realistic in assessing what has happened now, because what has happened has, you know, the background of 50, 70 or more years of heavy manipulation of how the U.S. public works through all sorts of media, all sorts of engineering, all sorts of manipulation. I mean, it has to be seen in that context. In context of everything else we have seen and how U.S. elections are run, 
I can't really say that this election was an outlier. I mean, the US elections have traditionally been a source of great innovation. We can call it of the evil sort, perhaps, but it has been a source of great innovation in terms of campaigning, targeting, propaganda, and so forth. Most elections have been like that. That's the reason why American political consultants then go around the world and consult with European political leaders and others how to run the referenda. So who goes to Italy to advise on the referenda organized by Renzi in 2006? It's Jim Messina, who is very much embedded with the traditional political parties in the United States. So all of that we know very well. So to present Robert Mercer, who comes out of the hedge fund industry, as the person who suddenly cracked the US electoral system and understood how everything works by linking personal data from Facebook to how people decide to vote, I just find it, uh, I mean, it's an interesting theory. I just find it a little bit hard to believe in that there is much more to the American electoral system that we probably realize if we just focus on how information propagates through social networks. If, if I may, so one originality compared to before any other campaign is how lean the Trump campaign was in the sense that it wasn't hiring political scientists, it wasn't hiring people, political consultants, yeah. to advise on what message to, to push or anything like they it. They were not expecting to win. Well, they were trying to win at some point, right? They were trying uh, around the summer 2016, they were trying to, but they ended up spending all their money essentially on Facebook ads that were micro-targeted and all those things. They were pretty confident that they didn't build a, a ground game in the classical well, but sense. As you, but can just one little thing, but as you know, with Trump, everything is about money laundering in one way or another. So, you know, when you have an operation which essentially has uh, the Mercer family owning all the other companies and running Trump's campaign, it would make perfect sense for them to hire their own company to run their own electoral campaign because they were expecting for them not to win and at least the money would stay within the Mercer empire. It's a perfectly reasonable theory which for some reason we're not exploring. That's another theory. So I'm going to give you the floor, uh, Ivan Krastev, but uh, we have uh, online uh, one of the persons who investigated on Robert Mercer. That's uh, Carol uh, Kad Waller. I think we have her uh, on Skype. <laughs> yes, hello. Hello, hi. Hello. Hello from London. Merci beaucoup. Uh, so, uh, thank you for joining us. So, so you've come just at the right moment because uh, there's a debate between our uh, panelists on the, uh, the whether uh, the, uh, the uh, whether the uh, Mercer ecosystem is so specific. Well, that you investigated, what you investigated of uh, Cambridge Analytica. So, is this something totally new? Is it uh, all that specific? Is it specific to Trump? Is it Trump specific? Is that enough to explain his victory? the Mercer uh, intervention, so I want your viewpoint because uh, this is uh, the topic you've been investigating for quite some months now. Hello, hi, thanks, oh, well, thanks very much for having me first of all and um, congratulations to Toma who's done such a tremendous job in following this story um, from, you know, r right from the start really. Um, so I, I, don't, I sort of feel that I'm just not the right person to answer that question because um, um, there, there are people out there who know far more about the American political system than I do. But I, the thing I suppose I, I'd answer to, to the, that the debate you were just having just then is the fact that it's just so difficult to know quite what the Trump campaign did with data and um, what was special about it, because we've just got no access to knowing what went on behind Facebook's um, closed walls. And, and that's the thing which sort of just strikes me listening to the, the very interesting debate that you're having there. That, that's the, 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 the unknown factor in all of this. Was there something different going on? Um, what, what, was the platform being used in a very different way than has been used in other elections? I mean, we, we know that there's things which have been hinted at about that in um, Robert Mueller's indictments, which were, we, were unsealed last month. Um, he's certainly pointing the finger to, 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 to things going on, on on Facebook and other social media platforms. And, and that's, so that, that's, I guess, that the angle that I'm coming at it is just that we, we, at the moment, we just don't have enough information. And, and that's what I've been sort of trying to get at is we just what we need. We need that transparency. We need Facebook. We need more from them. We need more from the other social media platforms. 
Ivan Krastev. So, uh, uh, Ivan Krastev, you wanted to uh, speak. Because we see this very interesting film. There was also this very popular book on fire and fury on Trump. And these are two different images. On one, you have a totally chaotic candidate and personality, which we also see every day tweeting something here and there. Here you see totally strategic move. You see the most disciplined campaign ever. You hit this micro-targeting. These two things does not go easily together. And I'm much more ready to believe that you have a candidate which was not easy to be perceived as, as strategic, as kind of a Mercer product, because I don't believe that he has the level of self-control so anybody can control him. Uh, and from this point of view, it's quite important. We have an elections that ended not in the way every one of us expected. And unfortunately, I do believe this election result is going to have a very negative uh, impact for the future. But then we started to look for the secret factor. And this is why I was basically so uh, kind of cautious to buy this story. We try to find something which is very technological, which is not political, to explain why did it happen. I'm not also ready to buy this easily. Because for the same time, we see three things that are basic trends. One is much more psychology than sociology, for sure. Secondly, we have big data, which starts to work. And to be honest, talking about technology and democracy, if you see how the Chinese are using big data in order to govern, to be honest, what Mercer is doing is not so pioneering. Uh, and thirdly, I do believe that this type of a problem is allowing us to also look back at certain things that we probably don't know about how democracy works. Because there is a famous book called Democracy for Realists by two of the uh, leading American political scientists. And they're showing two things which for me is very important. Normally we believe that democracy is about representation. So people have their views, they have their issues, they have their positions and they go to the candidate which is close to them. On the basis of basically all the data that they have for the last hundred years of the American democracy, they show that normally people do not have issue position on most of the issues that are discussed. As a result of it, it's very much identity politics. 30 years ago, when abortion was not a major issue in the American politics, basically the Democrat men and Republican voters men have a most similar position on abortion. When it became a major political issue splitting the parties, it appears that basically they went in the total extremes. It's very much the political parties that are creating every type of a vote is an identity politics in one way or the other. And I do believe that all this technology story should also try to help us understand how the nature of the identity politics is helping now, when through Facebook it's much easier to create this ecosystem in which you basically only talk to people who share your opinions. Uh, in a certain way, I find this much more problematic than simply micro-targeting. And secondly, that nobody is interested to persuade anybody anymore. If normally, I always believe that if there is a monument of democracy, it should be the monument of a person who is ready to change his opinion on the base of an argument. Now nobody is trying to change the opinion of anybody. On the base of the big data, I know if you're going to vote for whom you're going to vote. And the basic story is how to get my voters to the ballot box and how to keep your voters to stay home. And this is what has changed, in my view, in a big way. And unfortunately, it's not only Mercer, it's all political parties playing this game. Du coup, ça, ça m'amène so, uh, à une question que j'ai envie de so, vous poser à tous les quatre. So, uh, this brings me to ask a question to you for. So, at one point in time, uh, Carol, you said uh, internet disrupts uh, democracy. So, I'm going to ask all of you. So, does internet uh, disrupt democracy, or uh, do the uh, the use of big data or uh, social networks does it actually uh, make existing problems worse? What I mean that is the the crisis of uh, Western democracies, uh, you know, was well before uh, Trump's victory. Uh, are you going to me? Sorry. I'm, I'm, is Question to Carol. Yes. Oh, hello. Hi. Yes. Um, oh, it's so, so many fascinating topics to unpack there. Um, I think I think what, what, where, where I feel that I can be sort of clearest is because these are such big um, questions that you're debating. 
And in a way, what I've had to do with this investigation is to narrow it down and actually just deal with known facts in a way. And so one of the things that which I start, how I started off on this journey was looking at, um, at the referendum in Britain. And, it, and, and this, was, this was what led me on to the rest of the subject in a way, because we've got very strict spending laws in Britain about how much money a campaign can spend. And that is absolutely the bedrock of our entire electoral laws. And that's, that's grown up over 100 years. Um, and what, what we had seen, what these academics who'd been, who were able to tell me was just how in five years, basically, that sen the, the, a whole century of legislation that had grown up to protect our democratic, um, uh, our, our, our entire democracy in Britain had been overturned, were useless, because the, the, the black box of Facebook meant that there was no way of accounting. We didn't know how much money, we still don't know how much money was spent online on adverts during the referendum. And there's no way of knowing. Only Facebook knows that, has that information. And so what became apparent is just how absolutely fundamentally useless the legislation that we have in Britain is to cope with the new age, uh, the new digital platform age. And that was the thing which I found most alarming and disturbing because I attended uh, the, um, the sort of leading academics and regulators and everybody came together for a workshop at the beginning of last year and and that they all just sort of said well that's it we we that we we, we no longer they, our laws don't work and um and, and that's it we need new ones we desperately need new ones and they published this report and then um the government called a um a, a general election and it was just um that that's that nothing, absolutely nothing was done. And so that's, I find this kind of helpful in a way because the, 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 what's happening in big data and the ways that it can be used to nudge people in certain ways and um, what, what is happening, what, you know, the, 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 the whole issue of, of, of psychology there is, is, is a much, is a bigger question and, it's, and it, 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 is a, it is a more difficult question to disentangle. But just this very simple question of money, of uh, of now there is nothing there is nothing in Britain that stops um, a billionaire buying an election essentially I mean if you believe that spending more money buys more votes and that's essentially what certainly in America people um, you know encourages donors to spend lots of money then we're living now in a society where where there is nothing to stop that and and that's sort of fundamentally one of the the, the, the more straightforward ways of looking at this I feel Evgeny Morozov, uh, so, uh, 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 Evgeny uh, Morozov, I mean, uh, are we losing control over the democratic process? So, cynicalist in the European couch, I think I, I play the token leftist while Ivan would play probably the token liberal. So, for me, the problem is not really the internet that's disrupting democracy, it's very data intensive surveillance driven capitalism that we are all embracing in one way or another. So if we really want to have digital infrastructure that's not driven by data collection or advertising or extraction of data for the purposes of building artificial intelligence, we need to have a different model to pay for it. Because right now much of it is heavily subsidized, either by the need to show us ads or by the need to extract data to train deep learning systems so that you can actually have some AI products built with that data. That's what pays for your Google searches, your YouTube searches, your cat searches, and all the other online activities that you are pursuing for which you are not paying out of your own pocket. That, of course, has created this giant ecosystem, which has all sorts of negative consequences for democracy at large. I wouldn't deny that. They are susceptible to manipulation. But I think we have to be very clear in pointing the finger. And, and the finger, for me, is not necessarily pointing to big money, even though it clearly has an outsized influence on the political process, but it's also pointing it to the kind of structural features of this new ecosystem that we have, which will only get worse. I mean, they will not get by any way, you know, less susceptible to manipulation. And I am just fearing that in pointing fingers to the Mercers or to the Russians or to somebody else, we almost 
avoid asking the bigger question as to can we have an alternative ecosystem, can we have an alternative infrastructure, and by extension an alternative economy that does not just run on extracting and sucking out our data and turning it into something else. Because it's that very infrastructure that then encourages those firms to monetize our eyeballs, make us click on more and more links, and make sure that we click on links that are actually more traffic intensive than the other links. So that, to me, is the real problem. And yes, I fear for the future if that model continues, but I'm afraid those discussions are mostly missing from the public debate, and we are focusing on finding the scapegoat, which can be very satisfying, and not pointing to broader structural forces at play here, which, of course, then would open up all sorts of very troubling questions, including for the Democrats in America. For Obama, who was the best friend of Silicon Valley, he would guest edit Wired magazine just before leaving office. He would go and shake hands with the CEOs of all the tech companies. They were the good guys for the Democrats, right? There are all sorts of skeletons in the closet that I think need to come out for people to have a really honest, faithful conversation about what is really going on. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I very much want to continue from here because there's three things. First of all, money in politics, is it a problem? It is a huge problem. But keep in mind, the Clinton campaign spent more money than Trump. And stay campaign spent more money than leave. So from this point of view, try to portray ourselves as victims. This is what I don't like. Because obviously we have a bigger problem. And one of the bigger problems is the following. I was told by somebody that Eric Schmidt, who as you know, the head of Google, was the major CEO of the Clinton campaign. And he was very frustrated after the loss, but he was frustrated that she lost, but he was even more frustrated while Silicon Valley got it wrong. And he cheered up when he understood about Cambridge Analytica, because it was at least one of them did it. And this is my story. The other story that everything is going to be very much about technologies and micro-targeting and so on, what is remaining out of the voter? For me, this is the question that we're asking. Where are we stand in all this? To what extent you're going to have a free individual who is making a choices, and these choices can be right or wrong, but it's going to be my choices. Uh, and of course, many of the things that we're seeing are not new. Listen, being Bulgarian, to tell me that politics is run by rumors, this was how it was run. To say that you're not trusting the media, we have never been trusting the media uh, for a very long time. So from this point of view, obviously we're touching on something much more important, certain type of an important collective identities that were helping us to do things has disappearing. And I do believe this is the question about how democracy is possible under these conditions, what you're going to do, for example, with technological infrastructure and so on. This is the question, because otherwise we can go very much to replicate what the right is doing, creating an ecosphere, because they're going to have five films like this. You're going to basically replace Mercer with Soros, and you're going to explain if Hillary Clinton was going to win. This is basically what I do believe is going to be the right type of discussions, and this is why at least I'm pushing on this. Obviously, we're facing a problem which goes bigger than one kind of a successful micro-targeting or one kind of a strange speaking one hour per month billionaire putting money in something. Perhaps uh, this is the, the, the main question that's raised by micro-targeting. Uh, perhaps, you know, uh, the, the issues about its efficiency and also, you know, w you know what it tells about the way one uh, does politics and uh, how one uh, considers uh, uh, voters, not as a, a, you know, a given population, but a group of individuals. So, Paul uh, Olivier uh, 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 do you want to say anything? I think we all are in agreement over the fact that uh, micro-targeting uh, micro-targeting is uh, the uh, source of uh, many problems and uh, the massive collection of uh, data under the without the control of the individual the data relates to, and we want to preserve something common, which is the democratic process, so we want to reimagine together what might be the democratic process. So these are the, the, the common denominator between us. Uh, perhaps we don't all agree on the way it's presented in the film. That tends to focus on uh, an individual. But uh, uh, what, what interests me would be to actually 
highlight one uh, issue in the phone on the, uh, 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 David Carroll, who went to ask uh, to get his uh, data to Cambridge Analytica, wanted to retrieve the data regarding him, and I contacted him and encouraged him to do so because this uh, company is based in the uh, UK, and so he, of course that's governed by a uh, UK law, which uh, gave him advantages over US law. So when he asked for his data, the uh, company has to uh, give the source of the data, has to give much more information. And this is a topic they, you know, they resisted quite a lot. They continue resisting. Uh, so uh, there is a uh, this is a, uh, there'll be a legal precedent in this, so I'd like to insist on this because, in fact, uh, it's the beginning, according to me, I hope, uh, it's going to the beginning of an individual reaction, of, you know, a, a citizen's reaction to reappropriate one's data that goes down a, a, a line that's been promoted uh, and uh, to reappropriate data and uh, discussing the democratic uh, debate. So this is not a question as such. But, uh, you know, I wanted to uh, uh, put a question to you two. What what can an individual do in order to contribute to, uh, uh, to changing what is happening in this context? What can an individual do? So do any one of you two, would you like to take that question? I have to be. <laughs> so there's someone else here. Um, uh, well, I mean, look, um, I think we can, of course, demand more transparency from those tech firms. And experience shows that in the past, they find a way to perfectly comply with certain requests for transparency without actually losing much power. So, you know, I've analyzed that in one particular dimension. Their cooperation with law enforcement and their cooperation with requests for censorship. You know, activists have been demanding it for a very long time. Please show us this data. In the end, now, some of them do show it. You know, Google shows you how many times they get contacted by law enforcement, how many websites they have to take down. They get better on the metrics, and that has always been the kind of rallying cry of a lot of organizations in the human rights community, that, you know, we need to have better rankings of those firms, we need to pressure them through basically shaming those who refuse to release this data. I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's a path that we know how to tread, so to say, and I think there will be organizations that would tread it. But beyond that, I, I think ultimately, you know, we need a different a massive macro level change to how the system operates. And this is where, you know, we do need to start discussing to what extent the data on which these firms run should belong to them, so that then we have to go and ask them for that data, or whether by default it should belong to some other actor. That actor might be a nation state, municipality, collection of citizens, there are many models in which we can imagine it, in which case the data in the analytics, to some extent, by default stays with us. Then they offer some services on top. Perhaps they pay for access to that data. So here your tax problem is solved right there because they have to pay a licensing fee to access data that belongs to us rather than the other way around, us paying with attention for the ads that they show us, and then some of those problems will get solved, right? But again, it requires a massive reorientation of the public debate away from kind of accepting the fact that online advertising is here to stay and all we can do is just to tweak at the margins and ask them for some transparency reports. And pose the question of who should own data in general? Should it be treated as a commodity? Should it be treated as some kind of a national natural resource which cannot be owned by foreign companies and something of that sort. And that's a debate that I think Europe should start having because to some extent countries like China have already answered it. You know, they're not going to have that debate for another decade. They've already answered it. They'll come by all the European firms that they need to continue with that aggressive expansion strategies. And Americans to some extent have sorted it out as well. They have a massive digital industry and they're not going to do anything. They're just going to continue sucking out the data of other countries. So that's the debate we lack in Europe and it's high time that we have it. Yeah, uh, for me, this is uh, uh, going particularly to the technology problem, and uh, as I told you, this is not uh, my expertise, but we are facing a situation, and this is not only about us, the existence of big data, particularly being controlled, it could be a big companies, in the case of China, this is a state. This is changing very much the dynamic between democracy and authoritarianism. The biggest problem of the authoritarian state was the lack of relevant information about society. You're creating a huge police state system in order basically to get an information on the people. Listen, we're living in the world that you, nobody needs political inf 
informants anymore. We're informing on ourselves on a daily basis. You're reporting where you have been, what you have paid, what you have bought, all this information, and this is a true information. As a result of it, the potential to be manipulated and to be governed uh, is totally different. And I do believe this is what, when we're talking simply about elections, this and that, I do believe we, uh, we passed a certain type of a threshold in which the very meaning of how democracy works, what you can do and not do is critically important, but it is very different. And my, my last point on this is the following. There was a famous uh, American economist and uh, uh, sociologist, Albert Hirschman, who was always making a major distinctions between how people beha behaved on the market and how he believed they behaved in politics. And he said, listen, when you're in the market and when you don't like certain things, what you're doing, you're exiting. If you basically don't like certain type of a product, you're not going to start writing letters to the producers in order to change the quality, you're going to buy a new one. But he said on the field of politics, there are certain things that are so important for us that it's not easy to exit. It's our political loyalties, our country, our religion, and this is why when something is going wrong, basically, people are trying to voice, to try to change it. The basic problem which I see is that we all started to behave on the field of the politics in the way we behaved on the field of the market. When you don't like something, you're exiting. You see, everybody's ready to make a new party. Nobody's ready to invest, basically to reform a certain type of existing party. Uh, if you see, do you know what is the percent of the Americans which are changing their confession in their lifetime? Religious identity, 40%. So from this point of view, the problem of politics is very much also about certain level of loyalties and how it works and how basically you can use them. And I do believe this is why technological part is one of them, but the other is basically can we behave on the political field differently than we're behaving on the market field? Is a citizen different than the consumer? So, uh, um, Carol uh, Cardwallet, you're a journalist, so your uh, profession is to investigate, to go uh, uh, looking, uh, you know, behind the scenes. Uh, but uh, what, uh, according to you, would uh, be needed or necessary uh, to uh, to rebuild uh, in a certain way uh, the uh, reshape the democratic uh, debate? You were saying earlier on that uh, you know the British uh, law on. Uh, financing of campaign uh, had become obsolete and operative uh, uh, considering what uh, the advertising technologies allow today. So where would you start? Um, I think I would start with, um, it's so fascinating and they, you've got such amazing speakers here and there's these the brilliant ideas going back and forth. And um, uh, the, the thing that, uh, uh, it just, it's a very specialist argument at the moment. This is a very specialist debate, it seems. And one of the things which I think is most important is just translating this debate to people, to ordinary people who've got really busy lives and have got lots of other things going on. And I think one of, one of the key things which um, um, somebody said to me um, last year was it was this, technology, this, this journalist who'd been kind of covering technology from way back in the 80s. And she said, she just said, said, oh, data, this. her editor said to her, data, it's this terrible, terrible word, and it's so off-putting. And he said to her, you've got to remember that data is basically, it's like a naked photograph of yourself. And that's the way to start thinking about this and telling people that actually the problem isn't data, it's these little revealing snippets of you, which are all around the place, which is put together is some sort of naked portrait of yourself. And I think this this feeling of discomfort really is something that I, is one of the things it's, it, to, to make people understand that this is personal. It's about them. It's about their privacy. And um, so that's one of the, the things which I'm sort of want to communicate, I suppose. And um, you talked about David Carroll, um, who's in the film, and um, Ravi Knight, who's his lawyer, is uh, the solicitor in London who's taking that case. He makes a very compelling argument, which is that because he's he's not a data lawyer, um, he's a human rights lawyer, and the reason he's taken David's Carroll's case and um, you know is going through this extraordinary process is because he's he's like data rights are human rights, and that's the that's the sort of 
thing that I want to inject into this. There's just this, this very basic thing that it's about ordinary people and it's about our ordinary lives and just the, the bits of ourselves which we don't want harvested by billionaires to use in whichever way. And, and so that, for me, it's a communication issue is, is at the heart of this in many ways. Paul Olivier Dehay. Uh, so, uh, Paul Olivier, Paul -Olivier Dehay, uh, the way uh, uh, regulation is uh, evolving, I mean, uh, is this going to, uh, you know, uh, help in the European law on the, pro the protection of uh, uh, private data, which, uh, you know, the uh, uh, people, you know, are very much uh, in favor of because it's going to actually help uh, uh, protect uh, uh, people's privacy uh, on the Internet and internet users, so it'll also, uh, these laws will be there also to uh, sanction those companies that use data without uh, uh, respecting the uh, user's rights. So the new uh, European regulation 2018 that gives a, a little bit more uh, rights to individuals, but uh, there's also behind it, you know, it promises to be uh, implemented more seriously than the previous rules that have been enacted. So there's not, not, not a huge change in terms of the law, but more in terms of its implementation. And uh, I believe that, uh, you know, stories such as this one uh, that turn around, you know, politics, uh, which is a common process we've all invested in, it's not just about uh, 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 naked photos of uh, uh, whoever it is, you know, but uh, it is, and I'm much more interested in uh, the d democratic debate, and I think uh, you need to raise awareness around these topics, that data uh, are important, and uh, and we can, well, I think we can expect that regulators will implement the law uh, in a, a much more serious fashion so my startup is, is is working in this very field so we are really uh, thinking about the uh, implications of uh, these laws there are very uh, perverse effects that are uh, probable so what's important is to have a collective awareness uh, so that, uh, people need to actually ap appropriate, perhaps not everyone, but you know, as many people as possible should actually uh, uh, show interest in this uh, interest and should actually exercise their right. I think this is crucial. They have to become aware that they have rights and they should exercise their rights. Other, uh, this is important. Otherwise, we're going to miss an opportunity of uh, reorganizing the debate. You know, focusing on the individual. So, uh, Evgeny Morozov. Yes. On a, on a, il, il me semblait qu'on était à peu près une, un peu moins d'une heure de, de discussion. So I thought we were at about less than an hour discussion. So you want to ask a question right now? Yes? Unfortunately, we can't hear the person who's just stood up in the room because she's not using a microphone. So sorry, you can't, can't have the translation. But we'll find out very soon as the mic approaches her. Okay, okay, pe pe people are appropriating the debate. So I'd like to know uh, what can be done if we want to uh, uh, do exactly the same thing this American guy did to uh, actually uh, get one's personal data back uh, with Facebook, for instance. What, what, what can you do, or, or, or Twitter, or anything? What can one do if you, if you want to get... You're ta she's talking about David Carroll. So to, to exercise one's rights, what it means, so you have two possibilities. Either you, you, you use the law and uh, uh, you're going to be extenuated. It's going to take years and years and a lot of uh, courage. Or, or you, you go on personaldata.eu uh, and use the services that are available that are for free and uh, that uh, de 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 deal with uh, uh, raising awareness around uh, the protection of personal data. And there's an Austrian who did exactly that uh, with his Facebook data called Max Fremst, and he uh, received millions of pages. So uh, we're quickly going to finish the discussion with the panelists because uh, I think you know the, the the audience has become impatient. So you, uh, Mr. Morozov, you said there's a very little debate around this, but uh, uh, I mean there's a debate in France on you know should we uh, each one of us should we own our data to be able to sell them or should we rethink the whole. Uh, Topic: Are we going down the right road, or are we always, you know, uh, uh, you know, always behind, one step behind technology? Well, look. Let me just again co go back to this data question, because in Europe, the data question is mostly framed as a question of privacy on the one hand, and to some extent, entrepreneurialism. That once we become owners of our own data, we would be able to derive a check every month from how our data is being used for advertising. 
to a large extent, these two dimensions, the legal one and the entrepreneurial one, are the dominant domains and the uh, sort of dimensions of the debate about data. The, the dimension which is lacking is the way in which data is connected to, on the one hand, the non-existence of industrial strategy in Europe, which relates to the development of artificial intelligence, which is all built with data, and B, the transformation of the democratic process, whereby through data you can experiment with more decentralized public, local forms of government, which will help to address some of the populist anger against centralized hierarchical bureaucratic institutions. So those two dimensions, one, industrial strategy based around AI, and B, decentralization of public administration by means of data and empowering citizens, are completely lacking in Europe. They do not really appear in most public debates, which are pushed for by people trained in law, who frame everything as a matter of privacy, and people who have a very liberal outlook on data as a commodity, so they would like to make all of us as individuals owners and proprietors of data, which is a solution which I don't believe in because I don't think that data is a commodity and should be treated as such because a lot of the data we produce is actually social in character. We produce it as part of the collective. We produce it as walking down on the street in a public space. There is no reason for me to claim that data is my own because you know, who knows who paid for the sensors which are collecting it and who paid for the road on which I'm walking. So if we really want to have a robust discussion with robust political teeth, we really have to reopen those two other dimensions because otherwise it will remain in that consumer sphere which Ivan was alluding to. Because the problem that we have is that once you frame everything as a problem of privacy, then the only viable solution that currently exists on the market is to actually pay for privacy as a service, get yourself a number of apps, pay for them 100 euros or francs a month, and be protected from manipulation, fake news, be protected from cyber attacks, be protected from Russian hackers stealing your data, be protected from all sorts of manipulation on Google search engine. You can already pay for that. You know, if you have enough money, you can have all your privacy you want. What we have lost is the language and the discourse to address questions like privacy, like self-determination, like what they have in Germany, informational self-determination, through the language of rights, and not just through the language of services. Because virtually that's the model on which everything is supplied to us these days. And I think that we're not really having that debate, and the fact that we're just talking about data, to me, does not mean anything, because most of the discussions we are having, from where I stand politically and economically and geopolitically, in Europe, are completely futile. Even though, yes, there are a lot of them, and there are even a lot of them in Brussels. It does not make them into productive, useful conversations around which some kind of future which will appeal to people who might otherwise vote for populists, or who might otherwise vote for Trump, would actually be appealing. Those discussions, as far as I'm concerned, and I go to a lot of them, are not really taking place. Paul Olivier de So, uh, Paul -Olivier de Hay. so uh, uh, this has to do with what I was saying earlier on. The new uh, regulation, you know, uh, opens up uh, uh, the, the date, so the right to portability, which would allow uh, each and every one, those who wanted it, to go and reappropriate the data uh, uh, collected by a, a hundred or so companies and to uh, actually, con actually to uh, provide it to, to uh, the University of Geneva or Lausanne. Uh, uh, so uh, this uh, promotes uh, the uh, uh, property of data or the use of data. And this is important, according to me, as for you, to uh, you know, uh, move on to this new dimension beyond uh, the uh, protection of pri privacy protection, but to, to uh, protect data for the common good. So imagine, Amazon spends $15 billion a year on research and development. Chinese company Alibaba has committed $10 billion over the next three years to artificial intelligence. Now, my data becomes portable. Great. Where do I take it? 
if all of the firms and all of the services which have this advanced technology and which they have spent billions are outpacing every single public agency, university and local council in building actual infrastructures where such data can be inserted and be made useful. You know, I take all my data from Google, great. Where do I take it in a way that will interconnect my car, my house, my bath, and everything else that is now part of the Google ecosystem? I'm not saying that data portability is a bad thing. I'm saying that it cannot be the solution behind which all of us will rally behind and celebrate it as the answer to all of our problems because our market is not the neoliberal utopia where everything is competitive. We have five big players with massive state funding behind them and those are unfortunately the players to which you have to turn even if your data is fully portable. For the most part, there are a lot of startups. They do not really compare to Amazon or to Alibaba. We can uh, uh, discuss this for hours, but uh, we're going to have to conclude. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, Carol Cadvaller and even Kresti a few uh, concluding remarks before giving the floor to um, uh, to Sylvain Gisler. So, uh, Carol, uh, you know, what what comes to mind after all of this? Uh, no. So what would you like to, what would be your concluding remarks? Like to what people in the audience have to say, to be honest with you. I think that's the, it's, um, that's what's sort of fascinating about any of these discussions I've been to is, uh, is, is people, we, we just need more voices in this debate. That's one of the key things, I think. When I started out on this, it was very much, technology was written about by technology journalists. And it was technologists who spoke about technology and people in Silicon Valley who wrote spoke about technology. And one of the really, really key things I've learned is just we just need more people from completely different backgrounds looking at these subjects in different ways. So I have these fascinating discussions with people from all over the kind of academic spectrum. And I love the perspective they bring, which is completely different. So having a philosopher, um, you know, I I interested in these issues, having an anthropologist having somebody who's an ethnographer and and one of the one of the one of the the best events i've been to actually is where there has been this input from just lots of different voices because technology is just it's just too important it's i mean it, it give up that word now it's everything it's just the world and um and we've all got to we, we've all got to be sort of thinking about this and talking about it and bringing in people from all sorts of different areas Sorry, i'm i'm going on now but you get my you get my point I think everyone will agree with you, probably Ivan Krastev. Yeah. Uh, everybody is going to agree, Ivan Krastev. Democracy is based on the idea of political equality. And during the 50s and 60s, the major political scientists were asking questions, can we be politically equal if we're economically so unequal? So this was the question. With the big data society, it's becoming even much more important because democracy and egalitarianism is the following. What we're equal is, is not our intelligence, but our experience. In democracy, my experience is as valuable as yours. Nobody knows better than me what I want. This is what democracy is based on. This is what my vote is about. The problem with all this type of a big data is, we understand that now that my wife knows better, I mean, the micro, uh, the technology knows better than my wife, which is not surprising, uh, but uh, uh, the basic problem is that at some point, the big data knows better than me. And this is the story. And one of the major story when we talk about the trust and particularly the crisis of the trust in mainstream media, this was the collapse of the local papers. Because it was the local newspapers and the fact that you have an experience which is real and through them in a certain way you're also building your trust in other type of a media you can compare and so on. Local media disappeared. There was a lot of studies showing in the United States very strong correlations of people living in a places where there is not local newspaper surviving, being much more ready to be kind of a consumers of a fake news. And in my view, how to make our real life experience matter in taking political decisions. This is critically important. Otherwise, there is technology, there is a legal story, there is others. But we're empowering ourselves by making our kind of a real life experiencing uh, matter. And from this point, doing things. This is why when people go on the street, when they go to protest, when they go to do something with their bodies and not simply clicking, this is changing politics much more. And this is why basically some of these technologies does not work in the way they normally work on the elections.
Merci. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the four of you before giving the floor to the audience. So we're going to welcome uh, Sylvain Gisler, who's the co-founder of uh, Operation Libero. And uh, this is a political uh, movement, and it claims to be so, a Swiss uh, political movement that uh, fights uh, uh, the extreme right uh, to have a, a positive, positive usage of uh, uh, technology. So he's going to uh, conclude this discussion. Hi. Hi. Uh, glad to see you all. Uh, thanks to be here. Um, I'm Silon Gisler. Uh, I'm a campaigner, like not from Trump, not from Brexit. I'm from Operation Libero, like liberal movement in Switzerland. And I guess it's late, it's dark outside, but I I'm guess I'm, I'm here to kind of bring the optimist perspective into online campaigning for the future. That's what I normally do in discussions like this. Like Optimism this. in front. Optimism to the light. <laughs> no. um, well, I'm from Operation Libero. We started four years ago. We are a liberal political movement from Switzerland. We started with zero money, zero impact, zero whatever. And now we're here. We fought in votations against mostly right wing populists, and we won five times. We fought five times. We won five times, and we're now completely crowdfunded. We have a great community. We have even a group here in Geneva who's supporting us, who does a great job in campaigning as well. And, well, all this wouldn't have happened without the internet, without the technology which gave us tools to make campaigning on a level without money or without money at the beginning. So. I think this is the positive perspective I want to bring in. I think political campaign and online campaigning and the internet gives lots of opportunities, opportunities to do this. And, well, I talked before this um, panel, if this is an exceptional case and the other cases like we talked today about are the way we go there true? I don't think so. I mean, we talked also about the Barack Obama campaign and why there wasn't this critical point of view uh, we had now in this discussion. And I guess there's one reason, it's pretty simple, and let's be honest, we don't like the result of these campaigns, right? We don't like that they won. And this time, the bad guys won. And it's, uh, it leads to us that techno uh, technology, um, which we thought can be something in campaigning where a civic movement can engage and disrupt maybe systems is something that is being used for good and bad and it's clear that it's being used from everyone as it has been told in this panel as well. So this is one reason and the second reason I guess it's something about losing control. It's losing control from a public point of view because we don't know exactly what happening. This is what we talked, uh, Carol talked about um, democracy in darkness. And the other, uh, other point of losing control is like we don't own our data anymore. So this is what we talk also about, that we aren't owners of our data anymore. So there's two types of losing control. And I think this all leads to a certain critic, uh, criti uh, criticism of new technologies. And I think this is right. It also leads to a mistrust of what's going to happen. And one and a half week ago, we had a rotation in Switzerland um, where um, the initiative wanted to shut down the public media. And there have been polls. One week before the rotation, the poll said, well, the initiative is going to end with 60% no word voters. So it was pretty clear that the initiative won't succeed. But there have been a lot of people who said, I don't believe it. I think something's going on in the underground. There's maybe some dark posts. We don't know what happens. And I think this is something which is important and I want to um, bring in uh, here, like this mistrust that in, 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 the, in the political system and this mistrust in campaigning and the thinking that there's something like Black, dark, yeah, black magic somewhere, and 
I think I told them then, well, I'm a campaigner and they're completely overrating my job. It's completely overrated. I guess it's not about magic. And I think this is important also for the discussion. Like it's, of course, it's about technology, it's about tools, it's about how effective are they. We don't know yet exactly how effective they are. We know that there have been an impact and Trump at Brexit and whatever. But it's not dark magic. It's not Saruman or Sarbon. It's not Gandalf the White, it's not Harry Potter, and it's not Lord Voldemort. It's just, it's, there are tools, and it's technicians, and we have to deal with it, and I guess we have to, can deal with it in good or in bad manners. And so it's just an appeal to take back the control, to just um, like make a citation of Brexit campaign. We can take back control in kind of that we can have to deal with the situation, we can also, like civic movements can use these tools, and we can, like, when there are fake news, for example, then let's fight them. We can, for Operation Libero, we have online warriors who go out there and fight against fake news. So we had built a tool against the other tool. So I think this is kind of a way to go in taking back control as much as we can. That's it. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. So uh, now uh, the audience has the floor. So, uh, so you can uh, address your question to uh, any of the panelists or to uh, uh, Sylvain Gisler or uh, Mr. Thomas Huchon, who's in the room, and Carol, of course, yes. Uh, and she's still with us. Carol, hi. <laughs> So, I have a, a question uh, for the uh, film director. He didn't uh, talk about the uh, possible involvement of the Russian in the uh, election of uh, Donald Trump. I mean, well, did he do it? On, was it? Was it done on purpose? Uh, could you say anything? Because you didn't mention at all the uh, uh, the possible involvement of Russia in Trump's election. Yes, so the film uh, came out in uh, June 2017 on the uh, Spacey uh, platform. And uh, so we stopped uh, uh, shooting the film. Uh, end of March 2017, it was in Geneva with uh, Paul Olivier. And uh, in fact, uh, at that uh, point in time, I, I didn't have the facts, the factual means to involve or to prove or, or evidence to uh, go to show that the Russians were involved. And of course, facts, and according to what Carol up on the screen, she uh, came across certain facts. Yes, it's true. I mean, you know, give or take to uh, uh, understand what happened in the uh, last year. So you go and see a film that was uh, screened on Arte, which is a film by Paul Moreva on the uh, Russian manipulation of the American campaign. And I believe that uh, so in this film, well, of course, so uh, uh, we're well aware of the fact that uh, uh, certain uh, persons or certain Russian agents uh, tried to uh, get involved, but I mean, the role played by Mr. Mercer and by Cambridge Analytica is, you know, is much greater than what was done by the Russians. I mean, the, the, the facts we have, there was a 470 pages, Facebook pages, that were created by the Russians, and with 100,000 uh, advertising uh, money targeting Facebook, uh, they hit upon uh, about 150 million American citizens. Uh, so it's not $100 million that uh, Mercer invested, but perhaps he's not as powerful as uh, one would like him, you know, uh, after listening to uh, Evgeny and the other panelists, he's $11 million. So if you multiply this number of 150 million American citizens uh, uh, that were, you know, uh, actually targeted, you get to colossal numbers. So uh, back to what uh, uh, Sylvan was saying a few minutes ago. Well, of course, the, the uh, results of the elections uh, were not happy with him, but 
we're unhappy with them, not because we're left or right. It's because it brings to power uh, people who are authoritarian and who don't uh, respect democracy. And uh, at the end of the day, I think what's fundamental in all of this is uh, uh, it's the personality of the candidates uh, that's troublesome. But, uh, you know, uh, I personally, I'm against tools. And I would have been against these tools. And I, 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 I criticized Bernie Sanders' tools, uh, who was using them. And as the candidate, uh, you know, I felt the closest to. But uh, I, and uh, being an American citizen, I may have voted for Bernie Sanders, but I was against the fact that he was using the same tools. So it's not so much about the usage, but it's the tool. So it's in relation to this that uh, there's a lot of stake today. So other questions? Yes. Ooh, lots of hands raised. It's working. Yes, yes, it's working. Good evening. So, uh, 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 allow me a comment to the, I'd like to make to the Swiss politician. So, I find that it's a, I think uh, it's a good thing that the American people voted for a Trump who may be a bad guy, but who's 10 times better than this uh, awful uh, person, that is Hillary Clinton, who, uh, who gave her support to Nicolas Sarkozy, who was at the head of the uh, uh, coalition who uh, uh, illegally uh, uh, attacked uh, Libya and Libya that uh, had a dictator uh, leading it, but uh, that, that was the uh, quote-unquote Switzerland of Northern Africa and uh, a country much less corrupt than other North African countries. That's what I wanted to say uh, uh, as comments go. Now uh, uh, comes my question. I, I read the title. So is democracy uh, being swallowed by the internet or gobbled up by the internet? And this uh, uh, makes me very angry to read this uh, title. And I'll tell you why I'm so angry. Is democracy being uh, gobbled up by the internet? Uh, so so uh, internet is being accused of for being responsible for uh, most of the fake news. I mean, are we not forgetting that uh, uh, if we take the case of France, uh, we're not tending f to forget that for the last 70 years, 70, because of uh, the censorship of uh, different French governments, uh, because of that censorship, the French media ha have been uh, actually uh, um, fed, uh, overfed, and then the French public were uh, actually uh, fed by fake news. Your question, so don't you believe that um, since internet has existed, it's the first time since uh, humanity has walked on Earth that people can look for news by actually uh, uh, avoiding the governments. The governments, all they do is to censor information. So, so, so nobody said internet was responsible for fake news, and fake news is actually manufactured by human beings. Um, uh, I don't know if anyone wants to um, take that question. Uh, I just want to uh, clarify something. You you have the right to your opinions, uh, sir, and uh, it's good for you to express them. So the American people didn't choose Donald Trump. The Americans voted for Hillary Clinton, even if it was a very bad candidate, but it's three million votes ahead of uh, Trump. So we need to understand the fact that Hillary, uh, it has happened that uh, candidates that have less uh, votes from a national standpoint, uh, you know, lose the election. I mean, okay, we're still waiting for the, the, the counts when George Bush, he has a 250, 300,000 votes behind his uh, adversary. So uh, the, the proportion is 10, ten twofolds. Uh, so again, considering that, so talking about, so the American people did not vote for Donald Trump. It is not true. It's, it's a fake news. So, uh, okay, I, I, I'd like to respond. I think internet really offers to go down your road, offers the uh, possibility to each and every one to access more and more information that it ever has, he, he or she has ever been able to do. I can, you know, pull out my phone, you can ask me a question in about one minute's time, I can give you the answer to that question. 
The, the problem uh, lies in the fact that uh, many people uh, don't uh, have a, a good enough understanding of the mechanisms that are going to uh, lead to that information getting to them. So th this uh, can be uh, poisoned or not to influence. It can be toxic. And people, uh, the, 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 the majority of people, and you know, I include myself, and it happens to me uh, regularly, so we don't have the capacity. And there's, there's a problem on the origin, the traceability, uh, the source of the information. And this, uh, this freedom of access to information can actually cause damage uh, for our own uh, personal use. Can I add something also? Um, very quickly, because I think, you know, we can disagree with the opinions expressed, but, you know, I think they do point to a dimension that we cannot be hiding from, and it's that before this Trump election and Brexit triggered this fake, this wave of concerns about fake news, there have been a lot of very legitimate reasons to challenge and doubt the ability of most experts in many fields to do their job correctly. We have seen this throughout the last decade, or last two decades, journalists, and especially American journalists, who dragged the entire country and many others into a war over a non-existing premise in the Middle East. We have seen economists failing badly to address, even predict the uh, economic crisis, with the Queen of England, the greatest populist known to humanity, uh, accusing them of actually failing to do their job properly. We have a lot of people being very angry at politicians for being corrupt and having all sorts of corrupt deals with the companies, lobbying and many other uh, institutional groups. We cannot be hiding from that by pretending that this is just Putin or Russia Today or Facebook or the Mercers who are driving all this discontent with those experts. This discontent is real and it has a base in actual reality. And I think that we have to understand that this is something that is happening and we cannot just be pretending that any legitimate questioning of journalistic, political, economic, or any other kind of expertise is just an expression of mad populism and people influenced and brainwashed by ads they see online. Because this is not the case. That anger is real, and that anger has to do with the actual reality that people experience as they go about living their lives. And I think that it's the elites, many of them in the media, who keep living in that bubble, thinking that our democracy functions perfectly, media do their job, and everything from the economists to think tanks to everything else has up until now been uncorrupted by money and by private donations and by money coming from oil companies or Wall Street or Silicon Valley. And now in the last two or three years, because of our data leaving our files, somehow we've all become susceptible. It's a very simplistic narrative that will trigger an even bigger populist backlash. So I think we should not be hiding away from it. And we should actually be able to prepare to stand up and say that, yes, fake news, crisis, manipulation of uh, opinion, and so forth. But there are very real reasons why people flock to sites like Breitbart. And it has to do with the fact that there is an overall crisis of legitimacy in mainstream media. And that crisis is real. It's not fake. It's not manufactured from the outside. But you cannot be denying that that anger has been brewing for many people for decades. It's not the manufacturing of fake news or Facebook. No, but I totally agree with what you said, but we cannot say that there is not... I totally agree with what you say, Yevgeny. I totally agree. Um, there is a real problem with legitimacy. But this does not... Um, uh, uh, this does not put away the fact that there are real manipulators of our mind that put billions of dollars into this and work creating fake news, creating uh, fake content, creating uh, conspiracy theories, anti-Semitic uh, uh, thing, racist stuff. And these people are funded, they are a lot of money, and they are doing this job. So I totally agree with you. But on the other side, there's also the bad guys doing the bad job. Sure, 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 but you know, calling them bad guys is so simplistic because most of those bad guys are the people we elect. You know, you've seen in your own film that most of Cambridge Analytica contracts come from NATO, British government, and many other government organizations. Those are not bad guys, those are the people we elect. But just one sentence. French are the good guys yeah, now, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, but, but, <laughs> 
But, but, a good yeah, but, 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 but let's agree on, uh, and I do believe we have agreement. There is a real problem, and of course when there is a real problem, there are people who are trying to profit out of it. The problem is on what you're going to focus. One is basically to say what happened was simply the conspiracy. Vast conspiracy, as one presidential candidate used to say, and let's, if there was no Mercer, our democracy is going to function normally. This is where basically our disagreement come. Of course there is Mercer and there is Bannon and there always have been people who have been doing and trying to manipulate people on this and that. But the idea of the manipulation is you stop to be interested in why these people behave in the way they are. You're putting them as the victims of somebody who is playing basically their minds and why they're doing this. There was something wrong not to be interested why people were voting for somebody as mean as Trump. To be honest, what struck me, and uh, it's not about politics, people does not need to be great on judging on the political ideas of leaders, but I do believe what was striking in the case of Donald Trump is that they voted for somebody who has a character is very mean. And it was obvious to everybody. So from this point of view, it's about human qualities, it's not about political positions. But this became obvious because for them, his meanness was the only way to punish the elite. You entered up with a democracy in which the most important is to punish the other side. The other side to suffer, to be hurt. And this is you're going to vote for the ugliest, for the most awful, and this is what you like in him. Oula, alors là du coup, il y a... Plein, 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 plein de wow, uh, uh, lots of hands being raised. Okay, so uh, so as I have the mic, uh, I'll uh, ask the next question. So sorry. So I'd like to uh, thank all the panelists for this very, very interesting debate, and I'm going to try and uh, keep it short. So be behind uh, everything you've said on big data, there, uh, it seems to me that uh, there are a lot of uh, questions that have to do with uh, moralities. And uh, uh, there's also uh, uh, an overlapping uh, issue, and that is uh, political communication uh, seen as a whole. So in this uh, field, which is very vast, uh, you said it yourself, this is a, an area uh, that is uh, uh, not static. It's, it's, it's growing, it's evolving. I mean, micro-targeting was one of them, but there are other negative things that have been attributed to, to the 2016 uh, campaign. Uh, the, the, the level of neg uh, uh, everything was very negative during the campaign. You talked about Trump being mean. So uh, but here's my question. Behind these uh, uh, issues that have to do with uh, big data, uh, moral intuition, and uh, the, the, the negative side of things, I mean, that was uh, in the uh, media debate, isn't there the question on how do you approach political communication in the uh, American uh, uh, people and even in the European societies uh, as a whole? So who wants to have a go at answering this? Listen, uh, uh, there is one interesting story, and I very much agree that what is changing is very understanding of how we know the world, not simply what is happening in politics. When you talk about big data, being a social scientist, this is what strikes me. Listen, big data now is going to change the social sciences in the way it is changing politics. But what is interesting about the big data is you don't need to say, to answer the question, why anymore? You go with the big data, and you basically go with likeliness. I'm going to tell you that if you have BMW, and if you have a cross on every day, probably you're going to vote, I don't know for whom. But the only problem is that I'm not interested anymore why you're doing this. Before you have a theory, you go for a sample, and you have an explanation that you're trying to understand, is it right or wrong? And as a result of it, our understanding of society was trying to understand why people were doing what they're doing and so on. Most of our theories were wrong or partial, it doesn't matter. But imagine that in the big data society, you're going to have a much more precise predictions how people are going to behave in this or that situation, but you're not going to be interested anymore why they're doing this. And I'm saying this because as a result of it, all of these people, political communication, sociologists and others, 
they're going to become probably more precise in their predictions, but they're also going to lose power because they cannot create a narrative anymore. You cannot tell anymore why people are doing what they're doing. And this is why it's not simply about political communication in terms of consultancy. It is how to try to describe a society in which people basically are populated totally different worlds. Before Mercer spent this money, 43% of the Americans in year 2007 believed that there was a weapons of mass destruction being found in Iraq. So you have a kind of a parallel realities being constructed, and this was not even about micro-targeting, it was about identity. You are not pushed to change your views. You basically, any statement that you make is not about reality, but who I am. Where do I stand? Am I Republican or Democrat? Do I like, listen, when you said that there's three million people voted for Hillary Clinton, and it's absolutely true, but to be honest, Knowing how you're winning elections, probably if the other candidate knew that he should win the national vote, he was going to have a different strategy. So, and if you see how many governors and Congress and senators there on the Republican side, this argument also is not going to be enough. So from my point of view, it's not about identity. It's about trying to understand society, which in my view is much more difficult to understand before. And here technology helps to understand, but also blurs, confuses us, makes us believing that we know more when we know less. I think you provided your own answer to a question that you asked earlier in the debate, which was how to reconcile micro-targeting with the fact that Trump seemed so chaotic and said everything and the opposite. So actually, the Cambridge Analytica, the Trump campaign, was doing things differently from Cruz or from the Clinton campaign in that they were not building a theory, so this is documented, they were not building a theory of which message would resonate with which audience. They were just, as you just said, trying a lot of different messages with a lot of different samples of audiences, so a big matrix of everything that was possible, seeing which messages were effective before amplifying the, the message nationwide or statewide, the message they wanted to push. And this was very different from what they were doing in the Cross campaign, where they were basically swamped with building theories for each small audience of what was the best message to push. So what I find really interesting is that your own impulse now in the debate was to find a narrative around the past election, around what happened, the fact that Trump was mean and that that's what appealed to voters. So you're, you're essentially trying to summarize something that the machines in a way uncovered live during the election. Both have value, but it's a different value than before. Totally agree, but here comes my question. If it is only about technology, and if Cambridge Analytica can win with micro-targeting any campaign, because in a certain way the candidate doesn't matter, why on the primaries Ted Cruz didn't make it? And it was Donald Trump, which then there was no Cambridge Analytica, there was not Mercer behind him, he was just basically on his own. So from this point of view, I do believe that of course micro-targeting matters. And to be honest, I do believe that the way the political consultants see democracy is important way of how it functions, but it should not be the only way we try to understand what is happening. Sorry. But also in our phenomenological experience of everyday life, I mean, I'm sorry to say, maybe I'm the outlier and everybody in this audience is different, but I see hundreds of ads a day, I get convinced by none of them. So yes, I get exposed to hundreds of different shoes, I don't buy any of them on a daily basis. The idea that people behave like zombies who are seeing an ad about guns on Facebook suddenly change their opinion and realize that, hey, Trump would be much better for me if I really like guns. Uh, and they suddenly get swayed and vote for Trump while they cannot even get convinced to buy a new pair of shoes. I just find it treating people like a bunch of idiot algorithmic zombies. It's like it's a model of politics that reduces people to automatons. That is much worse than whatever these people at Cambridge Analytica are doing. Like, I don't see it in daily life happening. Sorry, like, I don't know, maybe all of you no, get swayed by these ads, but the kind of narrative of politics we are building that people are just a bunch of 
of idiots who see a map and realize that Clinton stands on one side, Trump stands on another, and they never knew before where they actually stand. That you know, they thought maybe Trump would be the best cosmopolitan, protecting the rights of refugees and banning guns and you know, uh, defending I don't know the the immigrants. Like whoever thought that in America, if you watch Fox News and CNN, which is what Americans do. By and large, they all know where those candidates stand on most issues. I mean, yes, it's all important, but let's not actually get away from reality, which is that most Americans get their political views formed on Fox News, MSNBC, and CNN. I agree, but on the micro-targeting, I missed one element that was also different from the previous campaigns, is what they were optimizing for. So, of course, you cannot tell, I'm optimizing for the number of votes I'll collect. But they were optimizing, like any marketer would do, that's what they were doing on the, uh, the Trump side, not the Clinton side, for retweets, reshares, likes, comments, very basic things on a platform. Exactly the signals that the platform picks on to decide what content people engage with, what other people like the initial ones are likely to engage as well. So there's this amplification effect that's based precisely on the signals that the Trump campaign was trying to optimize. So we were, we were saying earlier, Facebook was only used the way it was supposed to be used. That's exactly true. And that wasn't the case by the Clinton campaign. They were definitely not doing that. There was definitely difference in the way they were using the Facebook platform between the, the two campaigns. So, so, okay, I mean, you know, we're coming close to the end. It's already uh, uh, 11.30 p.m. So let's uh, just uh, take one last short question with an answer that I hope will all be also be short. So the, the, the mic is here. So uh, whilst I was listening to the debate and uh, after watching the film, I thought of something that may seem completely uh, out of uh, sync is the telegraph. There's a metaphor that says, you know, the wire that sings. I was wondering if the internet was the uh, network that enchants, but what is the enchantment about? Because this enchantment uh, through the democratic model uh, that uh, seduces us, and I hope will uh, keep uh, seducing us for many years. But on the other hand, in the film, there's a small detail that uh, caught my uh, eye, is that in, in the uh, meeting of the, uh, oh, in the myth of the uh, billionaire we all dream to be, and he said, I only talk one hour per month. I don't know if you remember. He said, I only speak one hour per month. Is that the myth of the billionaire? Who, meaning, you know, he, he doesn't speak. So there's no more, if you don't speak out, there's no more democracy there. That's all I wanted to say. So, I, I'm not sure that uh, uh, you require an answer, but uh, thank you for making that comment. Yes, it's true. You know, this uh, character uh, actually uh, uh, makes us think of what, what scares us because he doesn't even express himself. Very powerful, nobody heard about him, and, uh, and he hardly speaks, but he has an incredible influence. He acts. He has an impact, but it's true that uh, this analogy that you detected, which was uh, unconscious on my part, it was perfect, and uh, allow me to use it again in uh, future conferences and debates. Uh, so we're going to uh, stop now because it's already pretty late. Uh, thank you very much to everyone. And, uh, and uh, enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> bye, Carol. Bye. From the interpreters. <laughs> <sighs> oh.